numbers. When I spoke to you last in May, I was talking about the value of Moisins versus other guns. And back in 1960, for the price of a Springfield, you could buy four Moisins. For the price of an M1, you could buy eight Moisins. Well, this summer, it's been crazy. I was at a couple of gun shows. I'm seeing Moisins not under not under $300. Some of them are $500, $600. It's getting to the point now where, uh, for the price of uh, three Moisins, you can probably, you know, get an M1 Grand or a Springfield for one. Uh, one guy was walking around trying to sell a Remington uh, Moisin Negant for seven hundred and fifty dollars, and on the table there were O3 Springfields for that amount of money. All right. So for those of you who invested in Moisins, you can now tell your spouse that you had an AIF, an alternate investment strategy. AIF. <laughs> Alternate investment strategy, right? And uh, you invested in heavy metal, and uh, you, can, you can do extremely well if you, if, if you decide to sell, which of course she wants you to do before you kick off. Okay. Um, today I'm going to show you some Moisins. Uh, some of them are pretty rare, and some are expensive, and some are not. Um, when you get away from the Russian and the Finnish capture acquisition. Uh, you start getting all sorts of neat varieties and variations. Now, if I could ever, you know, the old, if only my guns could talk and they could tell me their history, it'd be fantastic. If, if, if I had that magic genie and I had to pick one gun in my collection to get its history, it'd be this one right here. Um, Joe picked this up at a gun shop here in New Jersey. And they sold it to him. He's got the bill of sale. They sold it to him as a 762 Moisin the Gant rifle. Okay? It is 762 eventually. Okay? He, he went to the range and he had trouble getting on paper, so he was very unhappy with it. Okay? And he brought it to me to try to examine. And the first thing I noticed was the arsenal. It was made in 1913, and I'm probably mispronouncing it. Stryovsky or Stryovsky. It's a rare arsenal because when the Soviets took over, they closed it down because it had too many. Uh, supporters, they felt uh, the, the czar and it was too close to the border. So any gun made from that arsenal is, is a collector's piece. Okay? And this particular rifle was made in 1913 and it still has the imperial markings on it which indicate that the Soviets never got their hands on it because the communists immediately started removing uh, any mention of the czar. So I'm looking at this thing and I'm going, okay, it's got to be an uh, import mark on it somewhere. Could not find an import mark. Uh, but I did find a little mark, and it was a, a, an E over a VG. I had never seen that mark before. I had no idea what it was. Looked down the barrel, and it was clean, but it was something strange about it. Then I looked at the sights, and, and not the usual designation on the side. And it's got two, three, four, five, six. And I'm going. I've never seen Russian Mosin Nagants or any of it with that numbers like that on the left hand side. So I started doing some research and what was pointed out was the Austrians had captured a whole bunch of these and converted them to fire their 8mm Mauser ammunition. This rifle is a squeeze board. The whole concept behind Play-Doh. Okay? You push it in one end and it comes out the other end a different size. What they did was they created a gun where you could put your 8mm Austrian ammunition and when you fire it, the bullet goes in 793 and comes out 762. At least that's the theory. Okay. Uh, this particular gun is one of those. And by pure luck, all right. About a year later, a couple years later, there was an article in one of these magazines that came out a year ago called Guns Surplus, Vintage and Classic Firearms. And in it was a whole article on the first squeeze board. And it talks about all the conversion methods and everything else. And it's a great article. And the guy even says, if you, you know, if you have one of these, contact me. So I tried contacting him, and I never got a reply. So if, when this goes out on YouTube, if he's watching it, I tried. I contacted the publisher and got nowhere. The magic thing about this is, how did this gun ever get to the United States? Because your other main reference book, 
the Mosin Nagant rifle by Clarence Lappin, says that Austria sold most, if not all, of these rifles to Finland. And the Finns unscrewed the barrel, put a new barrel in, and issued it out to their troops. So you can find rifles with Austrian and German markings that ended up in Finland, where they were used the way they were supposed to be used in 762. This one, it just, how did it get here? Okay? There's some in museums, because the guy's got a picture of one. He's got all the information on how they're converted. There is no import mark on this gun at all. No finish markings. Nothing to indicate how it got here. And I eventually purchased a Austrian sling for it. And about a year ago, before at the Meadowlands Militaria, I found the rare scabbard for the Moisen. The only people that really used scabbards, metal scabbards, were the Austrians and the Germans. They created a scabbard, because if you were a Russian, you weren't supposed to take the bayonet off. Now, of course, after I jammed the bayonet into the scabbard, I can't get it out now. Okay. But you have a scabbard that would be attached to the, you know, your, your frog on your, on your belt, and it goes with this particular rifle. Now, the marking. That threw me for a long time. What the heck? It was this. E V G. Could not find it. Finally solved the mystery. Okay? Whoever marked it just didn't hit it hard enough. It's O E W G. Steyer. This was a Steyer conversion of the rifle. So it's all authentic. Okay? It's an authentic squeeze for Moisen. So that takes the. Now, I took a dummy 8mm Austrian Hungarian Spitzer round that I have, which, as you know, the Model 95s were modified after World War I to take a Spitzer round. And I stuck it in the magazine, and it fed in the chamber, and it rejected. But I'm not going to shoot it. I shot it. It shoots fine. Yeah. You just can't hit nothing. <laughs> yeah. Joe put it. It, it shoots. You just can't hit anything with it. Um, it's some, it has something to the strength of this action that you could do that. But again, how did this gun get to the United States and end up, you know, not being modified or anything else? That is a mystery moisten if there ever was one. All right? Now, the imperial government had rifles being made in the United States for the Russian government. And there were two manufacturers, okay? New England Westinghouse and Remington. All right, this is a New England Westinghouse. Real nice shape, beautiful. And it's got a little American Eagle stamped on it. That tells me this is one of the guns our government purchased. To save New England Westinghouse and Remington from bankruptcy, they started buying these rifles, issuing them to the Alaska National Guard, the Colorado National Guard, and they also issued them to a lot of schools for training purposes. All right? They should be all over the place. They should be cheap because there's thousands of them. For whatever reason, you end up paying a lot of money for a Westinghouse or a Remington. Now, the sling on here. Most of them when you see pictures of there's no sling. Now, the reason I put this British web sling on it is I have a picture of American troops in the last, uh, in Russia, the North Russia campaign, and they appear to have British web slings. Now, if it has the little government inspecting mark, went to North Russia, no. The troops were sent to Britain. There were already moisons there that were supposed to be sent to the imperial government. They took those moisons, went, and then when they left, they left the guns behind for the, what's called the white Russians to use, the anti-communists. So getting a gun that we actually used in World War I, and I strongly recommend Canfield's book, U.S. Infantry Weapons of the First World War, Bruce Canfield, 
because he's got a whole section here on on the Moises. Okay, so they're a desirable collector piece, New England Westinghouse. Just finding them is the problem. What, what color is that? Is 762 Russian. This is used to, used to, now. 50 years ago, you could still buy 762 Russian ammo with dates of 1918, because me and my friends were buying it at at. Uh, Rutgers got a boat. And we'd go to the range and we would shoot them. Stupid us. <laughs> Can't find that ammo now. But it's Winchester was making it for the imperial government and later on for the U.S. government. Now, right below it is a Remington. Now, you'll notice the Remington walnut is very, very dark. Okay? Uh, that's one of the ways you can sometimes identify a Remington. Now, the Remingtons, when they came into government service, they didn't want them marked on the medal because they were hoping to give them to the Russian government, you know, once the Bolsheviks were thrown out. I mean, that was the plan. Winston Churchill referred to strangling the baby in the crib, taking out the Russian Revolution while it was still young. And that's why he's, he got U.S., France, Britain, Japan to intervene in Russia. It was a waste, okay? They would mark them on the bottom. There's a little ordnance bomb in the U.S. in the wood that indicated that this one was U.S. government purchased. Now, the sling I have on it is a curved buckle of sling. There is a handout that shows you, that tells you to put, you can put this on the Russian rifle. That's the other question. What do they call these things? One site refers to it as the U.S. Army Rifle of 1916. Another book says there's no such designation in ordinance records. It was simply referred to as the Russian three-line rifle. So whatever. Now, these rifles, when the, they also made bayonets. I have a real, I have a Westinghouse bayonet and a Remington bayonet. When the war was over, or when they no longer needed these, uh, they took the leftover parts and made all kind of drill rifles. Again, when I was in college, my friend Glenn. He found one of these Remingtons, mint condition. It sparkled, no serial number. It was beautiful. Every part was great. We went to the range, couldn't chamber around. Went to a gunsmith. The guy goes, it's got to be rechambered. It's not really chambered right. What's it going to cost? The guy goes, I'm not going to buy a chamber even for one customer. I'll never have to use it again. So forget it. They made them into drill rifles, and very common. You'll find them, they're shortened to the length of a spring field. They sliced the barrel, so there went the front sight. They shortened the stock, and they made them into drill rifles. And I've seen them where they're engraved on the side with the name of a military school. Okay? They were never meant to be fired. Uh, our next meeting, where's Will? You're going to bring it? Yeah. Will has one. Okay? Well, it, mine isn't shortened or anything. Yours is a full length. It's full length. Full, length. Okay. full everything. All right, Glenn's was full length also. Remington, no serial number. So you run into these at a gun show and the guy wants to give you a good price. It's not a good price, okay? If it doesn't have a serial number, it's either inferior parts or it was incomplete in some way, all right? Now, our government tried to get rid of these. Now, where this one went, I don't know. It's got MG3 on it, <coughs> a metal plate. And um, that could be Maine Guard, Minnesota Guard, Mississippi Guard, whatever. A lot of these ended up in what they call state guard forces, including those in New Jersey. All right. Now, after the, uh, World War I, the government tried selling these cheap. But nobody was really buying them. The most famous ones were when Mexico bought 15,000 of them in the 1930s. The Mexicans then tried to ship them to Spain for the Republican side. All right. Some of them ended up with the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. They were left-wingers who had joined to fight for the Republic. And a no, numerous <coughs> diaries and so forth, they remark how they received all these rifles, and some of them were Remingtons, and some of the guys were from Ilion, New York, and they were like, that was made down the street from where I live. But they also found some that were Soviet. They found some with hammers and sickles and some with Remingtons. And they were wrapped up in, in the Mexico City newspapers. So they were really curious. And they called these guns Americanskis. 
That was their slogan, the American students. They were Soviet and American moisons, wrapped up in newspapers from Mexico City. All right? Now, of course, the Republicans lost, so what did the nationalists do? They eventually sold them on the market. And you might have an American ski. There's no way to prove provenance. Now, 1954, I was, well, I wasn't was doing anything. I was studying it, and I was down at the Intel School. There was a rebellion in Guatemala. A leftist got elected, and United Fruit Company went nuts. So they asked the CIA, what can you do to overthrow the government? And they created a program called PB Success, okay, in which they created an underground army, in theory, to overthrow no. the government. And there's pictures of them jumping off their trucks with these peasant hats, and they all have dark walnut Mosin Nagant 91s. Okay? And the CIA was behind it. And the guy took off and the dictator took over and we were happy. War story that I got from two members of this club, two former presidents, Mark Aziz, who used to run Rutgers Gun and Boat, and Bob McKenna, both in different times told me the same exact story. They had friends who were working at Raritan Arsenal, okay, which was in Edison, I believe. Metuchen. Metuchen. Raritan Arsenal. And they said in 1956, when the Hungarian Revolution occurred, they were all like driven to this warehouse where there were crates and crates of moisens. And they had to load them on army trucks that were going to the military terminal in Hoboken. Trucks took off with all these moisens that were being stored in Metuchen. They never returned. And I have no pictures of Hungarian freedom fighters running around with Mosin Nagant 91s. So what happened to those guns? Nobody knows. My guess is there's a warehouse someplace, and behind that big, big box that says Ark of the Covenant do not open. <laughs> There might be crates of moisten still sitting that the CMP doesn't know about. Okay, you really don't know what happened to them. They might still be there. All right. Now this particular one was Bob McKinnon's gift to me. I call it gift to me. Uh, these were going for like a thousand dollars, and I told him, "There's no way." He says, I, "I said I want a matching Remington with U.S. markings, but I'm not going to pay a thousand dollars." He goes, "How about almost matching?" And he offered me this one for 600 okay? If you look at the serial number, now I'm going to go crazy with my eyesight here. You want a flashlight? Yeah, I'm going to need a flashlight or something, yeah. yeah. This is an interesting little story here. We want to hear the story. We got that on film. Yeah, the things, yeah. <laughs> this is a real nice Remington. It said it's almost matching. Okay, awful bright, which is good. Okay, it's looks like five eight three five seven seven, and the bolt is far is five three eight five seven six. <laughs> It's off the gun next to it in the rack. <laughs> but it's all complete, it's nice, it's got US markings still on the stock, which are very easy to remove by a purpose or by accident. Uh, it's got a Remington bayonet. And it's an interesting piece of history. Uh -huh. The Remingtons. Why aren't there more out there? That's the question I you know. Can't give you an answer. Alright? Now. After World War I, the, Republic, the Second Republic of Poland needed rifles, and they wanted to standardize on the 8mm Mauser cartridge. And they had Moisens, they had Manlickers, they had uh, Labels, they had Bertiers, and they had German Mausers. And one of their solutions was to take a Moisen and convert it to 8mm. And there's two variations. Okay. They're known as 91, 98, 25s. 91 Moisen, 98 Mauser, 1925. There was an earlier model that had a little hook on here like, a, like you see on a car 98. But it's an 8mm Mauser, 
and it takes the, the, the standard German bayonet and uh, they issue them as two models. Like I said, this is the Warsaw model, oh, no, Le Vuf, Arma Le Vuf, sorry, Arma Le Vuf model. They tend to have the slings, swivels on the bottom, okay? The other one was made in Warsaw, which is almost identical, except they mounted their slings on the back. Okay, side sling. They were meant originally for cavalry, then they were used by horse artillery, and then they were given to border guards. All right? Uh, these guns are hard to find because Polish collectors like me want them. Moisen collectors are looking for them, and German collectors, because the Germans captured enough of these that they issued them to their own troops. If you're ever going down 95 and you happen to go down to North Carolina, near Dunn, North Carolina, you have some time, visit the General Lee Museum. Not Robert E. Lee, the other General Lee, the one who was the father of the Airborne. Uh, his home is a museum to the early days of American paratroopers. And they have one of these in a display case because, because of his age and his health, he had to stay in the United States. He could not join Maxwell Taylor and the others when they went to Europe. The troops captured one of these and sent it back to him for, for his display. Uh, these guns were used a lot of times by what they call fortress troops. That is, German troops that were expected to sit in a bunker. They had no motorized, no, they had no uh, vehicles or horses. Their job was to stay and defend the beaches. And the gun used a standard 8mm German ammunition, used a standard German 8mm band, I mean German Mauser bayonet. So it's, it's perfect for that purpose. But it's a rebuilt Moisen, but it's still a Moisen, still a Moisen action, but an 8mm Mauser. All right? Again, these, okay, 77,000 of these were made. Uh, in 1939, before the Germans invaded, Poland sold 50,000 of these to Yugoslavia. And that's how a lot of them ended up in German hands. Uh, they also sold 2,000 of them to the Spanish government. Unfortunately, those were purchased by an American distributor or whatever. He purchased them and had every one of them sporterized. He got a deal with Fajan or Bishop Stocks to make a special sporter stock. He then had the bolt handle extended and bent down, and he sold them as 8mm deer rifles. Uh, if you go on the internet, there's a guy who restored his. He got a moisten bolt handle, he got some moisten stock, some parts, and he, he was able to rebuild it back to a 919825. But it's, again, considered a moisten. The other country, the country besides the communist bloc that loved the Moisens was the Finns. And there are so many variations. I really hope that somebody eventually comes and gives a talk on Finnish Moisens. They are the ultimate most Moisen. Uh, they put better barrels on them. They put better sights on them. They put, you know, the stock is better. They, they upgraded. They, they worked on the trigger. Uh, if you're going to shoot Moisens and you want to get the most out of it, get a Finnish rifle like this. This is a Model 39. This is the one you want for shooting go oh, like cheap Moisen ammo. That's another thing they're pointing out. The price of Moisens has not has been going up, but the price of ammo has stabilized. And the theory is more people are collecting Moisens rather than shooting Moisens. So they're buying you know five or six Moisens, but they're only shooting one. So that spam can of ammo lasts them a lot, a lot longer. But your finished rifles are Really, the ultimate, yeah. A lot of the barrels were free-floating, they really make target rifles. So. Yeah, they're, I have to tell people, uh, when I used to run my vintage matches, I didn't, um, originally Evil Empire let you use Spanish guns, and I had to stop because uh, you were using match against uh, service rate. Okay. Finnish rifles are really, a rifle like this, we still use these in the winter shoot. There, we don't mind if you compete against the Russian rifles. But for end of Evil Empire, we stopped. Right. When World War II ended, uh, the Soviets had already gone to a semi-automatic, were working on the SKS, they were going to eventually go to the AK. They started to sell the machinery to make rifles to other countries, to make Model 44s, okay? Um, and they've been coming into the country. Now, up here is a Polish one. It's still in the Cosmoline, because uh, I never took the Cosmoline out. But they were being sold, and above it is a Romanian. Uh, the third brand is Hungarian. 
Uh, the Hungarians not only made carbines, the Hungarians also made full-size rifles, and they also made sniper rifles. And thanks to Paul here, we have an example of a Hungarian 9130 sniper rifle. Okay? These are pretty hard to find. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think it's the only one I've seen. Paul, where'd you get? Where's Paul? Where'd you get this? Allentown. Allentown. All right. You can see it. It's beautiful. Now, one theory that's on the internet anyway is that a lot of these countries are still keeping these. Because they don't, they feel they're still useful as sniper rifles. So while they've gotten rid of a lot of their other moisons, they, some of these are being kept in, in, in stock. Now, last time I was here, we talked a little bit about the PE model scope. Uh, there's reproductions being made, and you know, they have all the original markings on them and everything else, but they're brand new manufacture. Uh, this is a, a Russian, but this is the PE scope. That's what they originally started with. Um, I know Glenn had a Finnish one that had a hex receiver that had one of these, and that was extremely rare and I probably went to auction somewhere. But uh, if you get one of these with the bigger scope, uh, the Russians basically found the scope was too expensive and too delicate and they went to the PU scope, which is what you see on almost most of your moisens nowadays. It's the smaller, the smaller scope, the PU scope they call it. Okay. Again, this is probably the most affordable sniper rifle on the market in the Second World War. And it's also the most mass produced. All right? Chinese. Okay, Chinese copies. The Chinese started, yeah. Well, on that question, originally uh, the Russians used uh, Carl Zeiss German scope. Right. And uh, how long did they uh, go with that? And then they switched to their. They originally, run, they originally bought the scopes and then they wanted to buy the whole factory. They were making a deal where they would buy the entire Zeiss factory, and I think they did. And then they moved, you know, rebuilt it in Russia, and they just ran into a lot of problems with uh, making scopes. And they decided that maybe there's a, a better solution, and they went to the, the PU scope, which was, again, easier to manufacture and more, and better sealed against moisture. So eventually it's hard to find you still see pictures of Russian snipers with the PD scope in World War II. So they, you know, they were still there, but this is the one they were mass producing. Now, your Chinese rifles, I've got two of them, and both of them were obtained from guys in my unit who no longer wanted them. Uh, one because, not that he didn't want it, in 1971, if you were a spec four with a wife and two kids, uh, paycheck is crap. As simple as that. I mean, he sold it to me for $50. That was one week's salary for me. Okay? Uh, he had a wife and kids. And he had a couple of guns. He had a Mauser and some other ones that didn't interest me. But he sold me this one. So this became the first moisten I ever owned. And when I went to the ranch to shoot it, I decided I never wanted to shoot moistens again. <laughs> uh, if the bullet doesn't get you, the flame does. Um, the muzzle blast, the recoil, the noise, and I'm going, and I'm seeing all these pictures of Vietnamese peasant women carrying these things over their shoulder, you know, I don't know. Must be tough little broads, man. Um, here's the thing. The guns that I've seen Chinese Vietnam bringbacks are really in nice condition. What hurt the reputation of, of Moisins, Chinese Moisins, was when they first were allowed to sell them in this country, they must have went and got the garbage guns. Because a lot of them came in, they were dirt cheap, but they were beat, and they just they just didn't look nice. Um, this is a Vietnam bringback. The guy that sold it to me was in my unit. He told me he was in the Arshaw Valley, and they found a whole cache of these rifles, and each guy grabbed one. And in those days, you were allowed to bring back souvenir guns as long as they weren't full automatic and they were not U.S. property. You could not, you know, get an M1 carbine or an M1 grand from Marvin the Arvin and bring that home with you. But you could bring back a Chinese SKS or whatever. But you had to go through some red tape. And in each case, the guys gave me their paperwork. So I have, it's a letter from, let's see, temporary export license under US Arvin Regulation 643-20, 13 February. 
and it goes to Chief of Vietnamese Customs, okay? And then it tells you whether you were cleared for continental United States, and you had to give this you got a certificate of war trophy firearm, and uh, it was a paper you also had to give to a U.S. Customs, I think, when you came in, saying it's okay for you to have this gun, okay? And I said, I have two of them here, and they're, they're different. The other one was a guy who was in Mac B, Colonel Holland. He was in Special Forces, and he brought back this one. And it's listed on his paperwork as a Russian gun because there's no Chinese markings. Before 1959, they put Chinese markings on. After that, just put 26, the factory number. So whoever looked at this said, probably Russian. And they put down Russian 1944 carbine, but it's not. It's Chinese. Yeah, this one's 1960. Yeah, this one's 1960. Now the bayonet's from an SKS. The blade is. The handle isn't. But this is the way the gun came back. Okay. So it's got an SKS bayonet. Uh, it's got parachute cord for sling swivels, and it's got an M1 carbine sling. It's all matching. And uh, like I said, somebody, you know, he brought this back, and. Uh, he had all daughters and they weren't interested in guns, so he sold it to me, and it's, it's a nice Chinese bring back, yes. Okay. Uh, the last gun I want to show you is not a Moisin, but it's sold as a Moisin, and it's, people tell you it's a Moisin, it's not a Moisin, and that's the Polish VZ-48. What happened was in the 1930s, Poland developed a single shot 22 when they were armed with the Mauser. So it has a wing safety and it fit in a Mauser stock like that Polish rifle back there, the Model 29, and it was a single shot 22. All right? Well, the Germans decided not to make them, so I don't know what happened to the machinery or whatever, but in 1948, the communist government decided they wanted to make 22s. So they made this model, which has a Moisin style stock and a Moisin style front sight, and it's a single shot 22. Uh, when they first came into the country, they wanted like $350 for them. I just looked at one and said, forget it for a 22. And then about two years later, the Giggs company was selling them in the box with warranties, everything else for under 200. And that's when I picked this one up. Uh, if you do find one, uh, if you pull the trigger and pull the bolt out, Look inside. Here's what happened. They have rings on a lot of them. Because what happened was, when they started making these guns, quality control in, in the People's Republic of Poland was not great with 22 ammunition. And uh, there are reports on the internet of guys who bought them with two rings, three rings, and one guy said he got six rings. Where a squid went in, and then the next round went in. And they said they still shoot well. <laughs> This one doesn't seem to have any rings in it, but if you find one, you know, check it out. If it's got rings, you know, tell the guy, oh, look at that, it's got rings, you can't use it. You know, let me have it for half price. Um, like I said, one guy said he had six rings in it, and uh, it still shoots well, but it's, it's a single shot 22. It's not a Moisin. Like I said, it's got a wing safety. Moisins don't have wing safeties. But it's a nice little, cute little gun, uh, again, for a sport. And it's sold as a Moisin trainer, but it's, again, not a Moisin. All right. um, I think I've covered everything here for part two, the non-Russian Moisins. So again, you go to the gun shows, uh, Moisins are still available. Uh, the prices are going up, though. It's, I, I don't see any under 300 anymore. And I'm seeing a lot of the long rifles going for 500. Yes? Who made the laminated stock moisture? Oh, okay, laminated stocks. Right. They were $129 a year ago. Yeah, the laminated stocks were repairs after the war. Yeah, they're not original manufacturer. Some Mac dealers would charge you more. Laminate stock, $20 more. Okay, it's, they're refurbished. Okay, a lot of moisins are some here, I think, are re were refurbished and became part of the uh, war reserve. Now, what happened was in the 1950s, late early 60s, whenever a communist revolutionary group wanted help from Moscow, the theory was Moscow would give them moisture. But they decided no, they were going to jump ahead. If you were a revolutionary left-wing group 
we want you to succeed for the spread of communism. We'll give you an AK. We'll give you an AK. We're not going to give you our old World War II stuff. So that's why a lot of those guns were being sold off when the, when the uh, Warsaw Pact dissolved. Because they had, they had crates and crates in them. There was a crates and crates of AK-47. Um, there was an article in today's, I think, New York Times. They estimate 100 million AK-47s have been made. Because there's an argument in Russia now. They just put up a statue to Mikhail Kolchikov. Yeah. Right? And some people are going, you know how many deaths this tool created? You know? <laughs> Take a statue down. Yeah, take a statue down. You know, you know got the over there too. Yeah. yeah, I'm wondering how long before they decide to take down the Buffalo Soldier statue on the grounds that they helped create genocide against Native Americans. But you know, <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, they tearing down the statues. Paul, do you want to add anything to Hungarian? I just know they're rare. <laughs> yeah, and actually, uh, most of them uh, ended up in North Vietnam. They were sent to North Vietnam? Okay. Yeah. When I was in the Army, there was a few guys that had most of the hand sniper rifles, and in each case, they were presentation pieces with a plaque that had been given to a general or a colonel, and then his white widow would sell it off because she had no need for it. And um, I never got one, but one of my buddies that was a close friend of mine when we were together, he managed to get one from a a general's widow was a presentation of most of the Indian sniper. But again, they weren't that many that were captured, shall we say. Yeah. That's not the sniper I ever Yeah. I just know they exist. <laughs> I heard you got one. It said they also made at the Oak Show, uh, first time I went with you, somebody was walking around with a Mosin Nagant with like a polished white stock. And it was an Asian guy, and I was I went up to him and he goes, oh, no, 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 no English, no English, no English. So I never found out what it was. Whether it was a Chinese made one or some other rare one, he was like, no, 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 no. Like, as soon as I saw the stock, it had like a, like a varnish on it, and it was light wood. And I had seen a picture of a red Chinese 9130. It looked just like it. And I was just like, oh well. It didn't call to me at that time. How would bayonets mark the difference? Ah, uh, the bayonets, yeah. The, 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 okay, the Remingtons have a tiny R, and the and the Westinghouse have like an E with an arrow coming out of it. Uh, okay, on the bayonets, that's another thing. When when they stopped production, they had a lot of leftover bayonet parts, too. And our government wasn't keen on, on the bayonets, and nobody really cared. And they sold them off without the rings as scrap metal. And every now and then you'll see them at a show, mint condition Remington, but it doesn't have the locking ring. And of course the guy said, well, all you got to do is get a locking ring. You're not going to get a locking ring. <laughs> Unless you buy another bayonet and take that locking ring off without breaking it. Because I think it's put on while it's hot and heat formed and then the screw goes in. So when you try to take it off, now you're going to have two bayonets without locking rings, okay? <laughs> um, yeah, with the, with the bayonets, uh, they're going to be very, very expensive now. The, uh, the locking ring ones, I don't see them for less than a hundred bucks now. They're they're just hard to find. Now the ones with the buttons, they run from fifteen to fifty dollars. Honest to God, you go to the same gun show, and one guy wants fifteen dollars for another guy wants fifty dollars for it. Um, they used to give them away with the rifle. They used to get the, the rifle, the sling, the bayonet, cleaning kit, ammo pouch, all that stuff. Um, yeah, there's little Lou said he just found one that's one with the hood on it where they knocked the hood off so it could fit other rifles. That that be that's a neat novelty variation of the uh, the bayonet. The two major ones are the locking ring and the button, and then there's the hood and the you hood thing the on. Huh? The thirty-eight. Yeah, the thirty-eight carbine never took a bayonet. No, no, but you don't have any of those. The rifle? Yeah. Yeah, I did last time. You weren't here, man. <laughs> yeah. Got a couple of them. Right yeah, they are. Yeah. I have a, I think, a, a Bulgarian 59 at home. I, I almost brought it tonight. Around. I wish you had. There's a room. I, all I know is cut, room. I think it was with the 9130 maybe cut down. Oh, oh. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. The stock is almost white on that. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. There's, there's another variation. I don't have one. And it's called the 9158. Okay. 
There's all kinds of stories. They're not sure whether they were made in Czechoslovakia, or Romania, or where. They took 91 rifles, including Remington's and New England Westinghouse's. But it has a star on the Truman Arsenal on it. Right, and they cut them down and made them into Type 38 size carbines, but they didn't put the folding bayonet on them, but they put the stock from a 44, so it's got the cutout for where the bayonet goes. But it's a, it's a 38 carbine, and they were... The latest word appears to be they were issued to East German border guards. Yeah. Okay? I saw it. So, okay. Yeah. And uh, that's a variation that I don't have, the, the, 90, the 9158. I allow them in the evil empire because they're, they're in effect a 38 or 44 carbon as far as I'm concerned. Are they 59 or 58? I think it's 50. Maybe it's 59. Yeah, it's 59. <laughs> Whatever it is. Um, yeah, it might be 5959. Whatever it is, it's, it throws off some collectors. When they first came into the country, people thought they had rare Mosin 1910 carbines because the barrel might say 1909. They're like, wow, I got the you know, super rare 1910 carbine. No, you had a 1910 rifle that's been cut down and modified for uh, whatever use. There was no stain on the stock. It was like raw birch. Varnish. Varnish, yeah. The, um, your, your Moisins, more and more was being discovered after the fall of the uh, Warsaw Pact because they started unloading their stuff. There's a website, Mosin Nagant 762, whatever it is. It's run by the curator of the Estonian Military Museum. And it says, like, copyright 2009. Then it says, I'm going on vacation. And when I come back, I'll be upgrading this. He never upgraded it. So I don't know whether he died or what happened. But it's got so much information on every variation of the Moisin that I doubt there's anything more you can add to it. And when new things pop up, uh, as I mentioned to you guys before, this is the American expert, Terrence Lappin. And this is the, I got an old one. I think, I, just, I think the fourth, I think I got the sixth edition at home. This is the fourth edition. Uh, every couple of years he seems to gather new information and, and he prints it and he's really the the guy that uh, that's the book I go to and then I go to the internet but uh, Moisins are an affordable collectible there's a lot of history behind it like I said some of these are going to be expensive the Remingtons in New England Westinghouse shouldn't be there shouldn't be lots of them here in this country I don't know what happened to them all uh, the Polish ones yes they're hard to find uh, Finland unloaded almost all its moisins that are in this country. Uh, the Chinese, before they could send us the real nice ones, uh, Clinton hit them with an arms embargo on, on Chinese guns and ammunition, which is still in effect. And uh, maybe Trump will be nice, nice if they knew North Korea or let us sell guns. I don't know. But uh, we'll see what happens there. There's also uh, North Koreans uh, use 91 30 snipers. They still use. They have a, their own version. Uh, North Korea, though, doesn't sell guns to anybody. No. no. <laughs> they're, yeah, they're, they're super collector items. You know, they just, they're very big as a Korean expression that means self-reliant. They don't like to buy anybody else's stuff. They like to make, a, make everything themselves, including starvation. Mm. <laughs> Any place in there said that they actually made them in octagon receivers? The only one, hey, octagon receivers were made on 9130s as late as 1936. So if they created any snipers before then, they would have put them on an octagon, you know, the hexagon receiver, we call it. Something I was reading once I remember. Yeah. The only one I've ever seen Glenn DeRuiter had, and it had the PE scope. And it was not one of these new ones. It was an original BB scope. Yeah. Uh, I think it had a 1937 date on it or something. And you know, I don't know where he acquired it. I mean, when you're when you're the, buy, the buying manager at Sarco, you want into things the rest of us don't. You get first dibs. And uh, I think his, I don't know whether his uh, widow put it up for auction or what happened to that. You know, but that's the only one I've ever seen was his. Are you ready? Stand by. You ready after him? Yeah, sir. Okay.